Well, we have enjoyed Michael's teachings for, gosh, probably 10, 11 years, and each time he comes to Portland, we go and visit him and, and, and hear the new things that he has to say, and, uh, and we've really enjoyed the wisdom that he brings from the Word, and, uh, and it's great storytelling, uh -huh. and just a wonderful man of God. Yeah. But we're going to um, introduce him by showing a video clip of the uh, Red Sea, so it's going to be interesting. Now we go to P. Hakiro, between the gorges and Baal Zephon. This is the body of water. This is the area where the children of Israel crossed. And found in this body of water, after Israel gave back the Sinai Peninsula, was this coral-encrusted six-boat chariot wheel. Now let me explain something of, about this particular chariot wheel. First of all, any artifact, any remnant of Pharaoh's chariots and army, after 3,500 years, would have long dissolved in this saltwater environment. There would be nothing left. However, the cre created for coral with a very specific property. Coral does not begin to grow on sand or silt. It has to have an artifact to attach to. And coral, many times, will form to the exact shape of the artifact. The artifact will then erode away, and all that will be left is coral, basically stone, that is the exact image of what was left behind. The robotic camera's survey revealed many shapes and objects familiar to Muller, including coral formations with right angles, arches, discs, and straight shafts fused into larger masses that had the appearance of twisted wreckage. Now, when we have been able to go back and forth with the remote control camera, we can repeatedly see that these strange structures we are looking for are there, not at one place, but you see them again and again and again. There are situations where you see something that looks like an axle, a hub, something that looks like a wheel, and you say to yourself, this is not a coral reef, this is a coral growth on an artifact. And that is what's different to me when I compare corals at other locations around the world. This particular artifact was taken out of the Red Sea. It was taken to Cairo, Egypt, to the Department of Antiquities, where it was then assembled on an eight-foot table. The director of the Department of Antiquities came in, and as he approached the table, he blurted out, that's 18th Dynasty. Okay, that was Michael Rood uh, giving us a show of what's on the bottom of the Red Sea. So that's quite impressive. That's something you don't uh, watch on mm -hmm. CNN. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, can you give us just kind of a little bit of uh, information on the Red Sea? the Red Sea and how that was discovered? Kind of kind of quickly. Uh, and we have, we have some poster uh, boards here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, and uh, on the Red Sea, this is really a very exciting discovery that was, uh, was made uh, several years ago. But this has not found any uh, coverage in any of the traditional media uh, because it seems that uh, this uh, nation and the media is uh, has been controlled to the point that anything that would uh, confuse the Darwinistic viewpoint that we just evolved after millions of years of aberrant chance mutations and that there is no God, any, anything that would, would uh, uh, tend to give any credibility to the scripture has been uh, very effectively quashed by the media in America. Now this is something that is known over in Israel. It's starting to pick up. Uh, there is a motion picture coming out on it. But uh, one of the big problems is the finding of hundreds, literally hundreds, of Egyptian chariots strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the ancient Yamsu. Uh, this, uh, this is one of the, the greatest discoveries of all times. But finding it, where they found it, 
contradicts church tradition. And this is another thing that is, uh, is strang verboten. It is strongly forbidden for anyone to contradict church tradition, what is taught in our seminaries, that which has come out of Rome. Yeah. Once Constantine's mother picked out a site for her Mount Sinai, then what the Bible said had no relevance at all, and everyone had to quit looking where the Bible indicated. But the chariots have been found on the bottom of the Red Sea. We've got it on video. Right. And, and again, you are uh, Jewish, but you are also a Christian, and you, uh, you uh, read the Bible as Jesus read the Bible, as Paul read the Bible, because they were, they were Jewish. And, um, you know, um, go ahead. Um, yes. Uh, sometimes people think it's strange for a Jew to believe in Jesus, or as we would call him by his real name, Yeshua. Uh -huh. uh, but I have to remind them that uh, um, you know the Book of Acts is full of thousands and tens of thousands of Jews who, in the first century, who believed that he was the Messiah. The Jews were the ones that gave their lives to get the good news of their Messiah out to the Gentile world. Yeah. And that's why the Gentiles even know about it today. We were commanded to first get the word throughout Jerusalem and then go throughout all Judea. Then we were to go to Samaria and finally to the uttermost part of the earth. And the, the criminal act, it seems, in our generation is that the Bible is being interpreted through a Gentile perspective, completely removed from the land, the language, the people of Israel, and the covenant that the Almighty made to Abraham, and is being interpreted in little numbered sound bites out of the New Testament as if it has nothing to do with the Torah or the prophets. Yeah. Um, this is not how we interpret the scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, the scripture gives us a stri uh, strings of stories, threads that go from Genesis to Revelation, and one of the most important ones is the one that's happening now in this generation, that in Genesis, Abraham was told to come out of Babylon. In the book of Revelation, the believers are told to come out of Babylon. It is one story, but is not being told by the church, because the uh, traditional religion, of which has become known as Christianity, has gotten so filled with Babylonian paganism that no one dares to open their mouth and to point out what is wrong so that we can come out of Babylon. And this is what we are doing now in this generation. You were... Um really impressed to uh, restore the Creator's calendar. Can you uh, just talk about that for a, a few seconds? Uh, yes, uh, Veronica. It was uh, uh, over 35 years ago that I began the quest of uh, putting together the Gospel chronology. But in order to do the Gospel chronology, we have to understand that Yeshua is going up to uh, each one of the feasts of the Lord mm -hmm. uh, at Jerusalem, and these feasts uh, are kept according to the Creator's calendar and the Creator's time clock, which is not something that is calculated by a wristwatch, but yet rather the movement of the heavenly bodies. And when we understand the Creator's time clock, because of the calculations that NASA has been able to do after putting mirrors on the moon and using laser uh, technology to track the position of the moon, we can now go back in time and find the beginning of the month for every new moon throughout the history of the human race as viewed from Jerusalem. This allows us to put the gospel chronology together and this is the quest that I originally began on. Now, what we didn't realize at the time, Veronica, is that we began on this, is that the Creator still runs the universe according to His calendar in His time clock, even though the Christian world has basically never known anything about the Creator's calendar. They inherited the pagan calendar from Babylon, from Rome, and on the other hand, the modern Jewish calendar was invented in 359 of the Common Era, right down below my house in Israel, in the city of Tiberias, that is where the calculated calendar was invented over 300 okay. years after Yeshua's resurrection. So we have so a Jewish calendar. Jewish calendar is not mm -hmm. accurate. Yeah. So um, again, the oracles of God was entrusted to the Jews, and so <laughs> here you are, a Jewish man, and um, you know all that history, and so you're able to say, whoa, 
you know, stop, wait a minute. And um, you were able to uh, recreate that to the point to where uh, I understand when um, in 1948, when the Jews were allowed to go back into their nation, um, you found that that was actually on the day of Pentecost, even though nobody knows that. Uh, uh, that, that that's right. On the rabbinic calendar, it was an entire month off. Mm -hmm. But on the Creator's calendar, running the celestial time clock backwards, we found that Israel became a nation in one day. On the day that we had rehearsed for thousands of years, it was the day that we were told the countdown, May 15, 1948, was the seventh Sabbath of the counting of the Omer. Mm -hmm. The following day was Pentecost, the day that we, we celebrate the counting of the seven Sabbaths. But it's the seventh Sabbath, which is the significant date. The following day is the day we celebrate it. The seventh Sabbath, was when Yeshua healed the man who was lame for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda uh, that we read about in the fifth chapter of the book of John. And so we see the Messiah uh, torching up that particularly significant day, and then Israel becomes a nation in a day on that very day. Yeah. A, a, a most amazing discovery, which is made uh, over 50 years after Israel became a nation. But because we all lost track of his reckoning of time, he didn't lose track, we lost track, and we finally discovered he is still keeping his calendar according to the feast that he put in, in place for the Israel to celebrate forever. It's so exciting because you hear that so much of, oh, well, we don't understand the calendar. When did this happen? When did that happen? And the new technology that we have today to be able to look back and pinpoint those dates and those times, it just makes the Bible come alive. It's yeah. very exciting. Yep. Um, it, it is a, a, amazing, Dee Dee, because, you know, we can be sound asleep, but yet the Creator is still spinning the universe according to His understanding, His wisdom, His calendar, and His time clock. And these are the things that it says in the New Testament that the alert believers are not to be ignorant of His times and seasons. That's right. But yet we've been raised in a culture which knows absolutely nothing about the biblical calendar, and we hear all the time, well, we can't know this, we can't know that. Well, maybe you can't, maybe because you quit thinking. But if we go to the scripture and engage our brain, uh, then we are going to discover the things the Creator has embedded for this generation. And I maintain that the finding of the chariot parts on the bottom of the Red Sea is for this generation. Yeah. It was not available before, and we have to get this message out. We have to wake up the Christian world, the Jewish world, we have to wake up the pagan world, and let them know that the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is alive. He will fulfill his promise to Abraham for the last days. You will see Israel in here all the land from the Euphrates to the Nile, and there's nothing that Barack Obama that Barack and Israel are going to do to circumvent the will of the Almighty.